we wanted to do, um, because I know some of you are familiar with uh, Catapult right now in our department, this is a technology we use pretty heavily um, in our daily operations, working with other sports. So I know some of you have had on-field experience getting a chance to operate it. Um, some of you haven't. Uh, but we kind of wanted to give a general just background on the company and why we use it at Penn State like what exactly the technology is. Um, and then afterwards, Marissa's gonna come up here and she's just gonna take you through um, just a quick demo on how to operate like a live like monitoring session. Obviously, we're not gonna be able to do it where in a classroom like type setting, right? Um, and we're not on the field during practice, but she's gonna give you a quick run through on what the software looks like and all that stuff. Um, for some of you, it would be a quick refresher, um, but we just wanted to provide some additional information and context for, for everyone in here. Right, so earlier in the week, right, I sent out in the group me a, a video, a TED Talk with Simon Sinek, right, author, and he talked about uh, businesses and how they um, can approach selling their product. And the big piece of that was starting with why, like having an, identif an identifiable why into your product or what you're doing is a big part of being able to. Uh, show that to other people and have a big reach, right? So whenever we're looking at a piece of technology, we want to know like why it's important to us and why we need it um, to help our athletes, right? So regardless of what that technology is, here's some things we need to look at. And some of us, we, we talked about some of this stuff in that class we presented um, and for uh, sports nutrition. Um, but one thing, right, we want to look at is, is the piece of technology valid and reliable? Are there white papers to back it up? Um, Another thing is cost, or will we be able to afford it? Is it practical for us on a daily basis? Again, we talked about, you know, there's research grade pieces of technology, whether that's force plate, motion capture, where it's top of the line, it's the most valid, it's the most reliable, but can we use it in a field setting? Some of these things we can, some of the things we can't. Uh, another one is, can it be managed, right? So do we have the resources, the personnel, and the time to manage that piece of technology and then also manage the data? Customer service is big for us and having relationships uh, with these companies because they can do a lot of things, not only from a cost saving standpoint, but they're also like an educational standpoint and a relationship building standpoint. Um, and then what are some other alternatives to this technology? If some of these things don't fit in, like if it's too expensive, if it's not very practical, uh, we can't manage it, what are some other things we can potentially look at or other routes we can go? So. Those are some things just general in technology, uh, but now transitioning over to Catapult specifically. This is why we use Catapult at Penn State, right? The first one is to gain, and we're gonna break all of these down individually. The first one is to gain an objective understanding of workload, so the work that our athletes are doing on a daily basis. Two is to monitor trends and changes in workload, right? And then the last one is to inform decision making, right? So capture the data, monitor the trends, and then make some decisions. Hey, so, yep. What is workload? So workload is just the amount and type of work that an athlete does or performs in any form. So like you're running, change of direction, jumping, sprinting, right? Contact, all of that. Just a blanket, blanket term of physical work. Um, so the first one, gain an object objective understanding of workload. So the two big words in this point are objective and understanding, right? So when we're talking about objectivity, right? It's, we're looking at unbiased numerical data, okay? So research has shown that athletes typically perceive training to be more difficult than the coaches or practitioners uh, intended. So Adam and I actually talked about this earlier. There's one of his buddies did uh, his thesis on this right, is just getting subjectively from your athletes how hard they think training was and comparing that to how hard the coaches intended that practice to be, there tends to be a gap there. So having a piece of objective data can help kind of uh, uh, fill in that gap, okay? So it also removes our reliance on subjectivity, which it doesn't replace it, right? We always wanna have a mixture of the two. We wanna have objective data and subjective data to paint a big, big time picture on what we're trying to do. Okay, and then when we're talking about having an understanding, that's having an understanding around training, practice, and competition. So what does it look like? Like, what are they doing? Um, and how can we use numbers to get an idea of what, like, a game looks like? And that's what we try to 
do is start with the game and almost reverse engineer our process. Because then if we have an idea of what the game looks like from an objective standpoint, how much distance are they covering, how fast are they running, how many contacts they have, then we can strategically plan practice and training in order to prepare them for what they're gonna have to accomplish in the game. Does that make sense? Um, and then also we're talking about that, um, how does it differ between position groups or individuals, right? So if we're talking about football specifically, because it's probably the easiest because you have a huge parity in um, sizes and speeds on the field at the same time, right? Uh, all, all the linemen's game is going to look a lot different than you know KJ Hamlin or wide receiver and what they're what they're doing in a football game. So having an idea of what they do by position or by individual is critical for us when we're trying to plan. So the second one, monitor trends and changes. Um, when we're talking about monitoring, right? There's two pieces, and we're going to actually expand on this in a later presentation with Adam, Marissa, and myself. Um, what we're trying to look at is the dose response relationship. Right, so when we're getting objective data through Catapult, we're looking specifically at the dose. So that's their exposure to physical stress. Right, we talked about workload, that's the work that they're doing in a training session, in a game, at practice, whatever. Right, the response is the physiological response to that workload that they're doing. Right, Catapult does not give us that information. That's where we utilize some other pieces of technology like our force plate jumps to look at neuromuscular function. We can look at heart rate, and HRV as a form of physiological recovery, but those are the response pieces. Catapult is gonna give us solely um, the dose piece of that equation. Um, when we're looking at trends over time, we can look at what a team looks like from an average standpoint. We can look at individual positions, and then we can look at an individual player over time. We can monitor any potential troughs or low lights in their training, or potential spikes, which we wanna to try to monitor going throughout. We'll expand on that in later talks and presentations. Um, and then we can look at what does training look like on a daily basis, weekly basis, and over a season. Compares from like 2000 to 2019, or 2018, 2019, 2020, what does that look like between seasons? Is that player tech? Yeah, that was just a quick screenshot. This isn't catapult, this is It is yeah. catapult. Yeah, oh yeah, not only. So just <laughs> that picture right there is actually, so Catapult has um, a very cost friendly version of the device um, for like high school athletes and maybe some universities that are on lower budget end. Um, and that's kind of what their dashboard looks like, which actually looks better than the one we have, but that's an example. It's of clean. Yeah, it? it's super clean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially like, bigger high schools, Florida, Texas, there's a lot of people that we use that for sure. Yeah, it's super cost friendly. Yeah. Can't do as much, but it, you still can get some good information. Something's better than nothing. It's almost like if you can just get a, a volume measure and an intensity measure, yeah. that's, that can inform a ton of what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the third reason why we use Catapult is to inform decision making, right? So when we're talking about informing decision making, the one big piece is you need to have actionable data, right? Data collection is great, like we get a ton of information through various pieces of technology, through subjective members, but if we're not taking that data and then using it to inform decision making, then it's just a waste of our resources, right? Um, so what, what types of decisions are we talking about when we're talking about informing decision making? So we're talking about training, planning, and structuring. So what does that look like periodized throughout the week, right? We're talking periodization for your kinesis major, you should know what that is. If not, it's just strategically planning your work in order to achieve a specific goal or adaptation, right? Um, so how are we planning that throughout the week, throughout a season? Um, how can we optimally load and develop an optimal loading strategy for our athletes? When, when should we add more workload? When should we subtract in order to taper or um, you know, primer athletes to get them ready to roll for a big event. And then we can also use it in return to play and rehab when we have athletes coming back from injury. Um, and then another big, very important piece we wanna look at is we're talking about data informed versus data driven, right? In our setting, when we're working with athletes and we're working with people, right? We use data to inform decision-making, right? We don't take those numbers and then use it to drive our decision-making. Right? What I mean by that is, Get this information from catapult we look at the numbers we see something and we say this is what we're going to do now based on the numbers 
right? We don't, we don't look at it that way. We take it as another piece of information so we can help guide conversations and guide the decision-making process, right? So it's a piece of the pie, not the whole pie. Any questions so far? Cool. All right, so we talked about the why a little bit. Now we're gonna go over what, what is Catapult? Right, so Catapult, it's a sports technology analytics company. It's based in Melbourne, Australia, um, which that's where it started. And it's kind of reached across right, the entire world over in Europe and then over in the United States. So uh, we have had Catapult users in the US since around 2010, um, but they provide wearable technology, athlete management software also known as uh, an AMS, and they also do some video anal uh, analysis as well. All right, so we're specifically gonna focus though, on the wearable tech, which some of you are familiar with. So you can see in this picture, this device, I actually have an example of it all the way over here. Right, here's an example of one of the devices we have. As you can see right on the back here, it goes right in the back of one of the athlete's shirts or tank tops, or we get strapped at the shoulder pads, but basically you wanna have it right below the neck on top of the shoulders, because that's gonna eliminate any like extraneous movement. Like if you put it on a leg, right, your leg's gonna be moving around the line. Gonna get Has that ever happened? Huh? I mean, we've had dudes try to shove them in their pockets. And then throw their data. Yeah. So, so we have to throw their data out, right? So that's why you wanna right between the shoulder pads, there's not a whole ton of extra movement that gives us more reliable data. All right, so inside of this thing, right, just from a component standpoint, um, it's made up of some inertial sensors. So we got a gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer. Magnetometer, yeah, I got that right, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so these are gonna be local devices that are gonna uh, track and gather information on what's going on in the specific device. Right, so it doesn't rely on anything but what's in here. So that's able to calculate any movement in any direction. So we're gonna be able to, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but that's what kind of goes on and what that, those inertial sensors kind of collect. And then there's an antenna in here as well. So what the antenna does is it connects to satellite systems so that way we can get GPS positional data, right? All right, so when we're looking at how it connects to, cat or to, to the GPS, um, it uses global navigation satellite system, which composes of, and you probably are really into this stuff with like the satellites it. and stuff. They, they missed one key satellite system. There's only three types of GPS in the world. One is GPS, that's American. GLONASS, which it talks about, is the Russian. And then there's Galileo, which is a European. I don't know why Galileo is not on there. Yeah, they don't, they don't include it, yeah. So Catapult uses the GPS and GLONASS satellite systems. Right, so the more satellites you have access to, the more accurate your positional data is gonna be. Um, so GPS is, consists of 32 plus satellites, GLONASS 24 satellites. Um, so again, we use to accurately uh, collect positional data. So distances, velocities, and accelerations. Does that make sense so far? Cool. So some examples of what these things collect from a positional standpoint, I just kind of broke that stuff down. So you get a measure of total distance traveled throughout a session or throughout a drill, right? You'll get velocity and either meters per second or miles per hour or whatever you need to look at. Um, so you can also chunk velocity distances up into bands, right? For instance, you can have absolute bands to where you can have, okay, I want to know, you know, band one from zero to five miles an hour, how much distance did an athlete travel within that specific band? You break it down that way, you can go all the way up to um, 20 miles an hour and above, right? To see how much distances travel at low speed distances and high speed distances. Uh, within, when we're looking at absolute bands, uh, there's some varying um, stuff within research, but typically for the most part, um, especially within like soccer and some of those other field sports, anything above 12 miles an hour is considered high speed distance. Um, and then over 14, 16 miles an hour is going to be very high speed distance or like sprint running. For like our football athletes where it's more stop and start in nature and they may be a little bit faster, we may look into pushing those bands up a little bit um, just because they, they require you to do different things. Um, then you can also, other than absolute bands, you can set relative bands. So that's based on an individual's max velocity, right? So say, um, again, I use KJ just because he's easy. 
right? KJ runs 23 miles an hour, right? Instead of giving him absolute bands on, okay, over 12 miles an hour is how much distance he covered, we can look at percentage of his all-time max. So 90% of 23 miles an hour, how much distance did he cover in there? 75% of 23 miles an hour, how much distance did he cover in there? As opposed to like an L lineman who may be a little bit slower, 16 mile an hour may be his max. We base percentages off that for him as well, so it provides some like relativity to it. Um, acceleration distances, and then for the, uh, the inertial sensor data, some big ones we look at um, in relation to catapult is player load. IMA count, which is number of accelerations, decelerations, changes in the direction left and right, contacts, and then jump count. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play a video actually on what player mode is. Let's see if we can do it. It's bold embedded power, uh, video in PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. It is, because it may not play. <laughs> How many times have you been in a class or something and you're like, oh, this worked for me in the office. Yeah, that's not going to work. No, it's probably not going to work unless it kicks on and it'll be talking in about the next minute, which it may. Um, <laughs> but essentially, right, so, so player load, okay, is a catapult derived parameter or metric. Okay, so what it does is it takes every change of direction. So again, we talked about IMA, so A cell, D cell, change direction, change direction of left and change direction right. Right, and it square roots them, divides by a scaling factor, and then it spits out what they call their player load number. Okay, the reason why this is kind of important is because when you go inside right now, we lose all positional data because you lose connection to satellite, right? So you don't get distance, you don't get velocities, you don't get some of this stuff. So we're, we rely on the components within the device to give us some information in regards to like overall volume of work that they're doing because distance is going to be your big piece for looking at volume of work. Um, so player load has been shown to correlate directly with total distance within a session. That's not going to work. There's a video for IMA too. So IMA is uh, what Catapult calls inertial movement analysis and I've already kind of explained that. That's just the total count of A cells, B cells and change the direction. You can break it down by each one as well. So by position, you could potentially look at which positions tend to accelerate more at higher intensities or decelerate more at higher intensities. These are on YouTube too, I believe, aren't they? Yeah, those are on YouTube or on their website. You can access them there. All right, so if we're looking at the types of device that Catapult offers and what we have at Penn State, right? We have four different devices right now. So you have your X4, and this is not the player tech device, which we just talked about with uh, at high schools and stuff, but you have the X4, which are men's soccer, women's soccer, men's and women's lacrosse use, S5, which football and field hockey currently use, T6, which is men's and basketball, men's and women's basketball just got that not too long ago. And then their newest device, which I sent out over the group meeting, they just kind of got um, validated by some uh, FIFA tests, their new vector device. Um, is out there in the end, but hopefully we'll have that here pretty soon for some of our teams. Let's, uh, no, you go going into it. Good. Yeah, go. So when we're looking at the X4 specifically, which we show which teams have that, so if you're working with teams that have X4, when you're looking at a GPS standpoint, right, they only connect to that GPS system of satellites, so they do not connect to the GLONASS system of satellites. So that can compromise your validity or accuracy of your GPS data, right? It's still really good, and it's, there's white papers that validate it, but it, it cannot connect to as many um, as uh, if it also had the GLONASS. Um, from a data point standpoint, what that device can measure is positional data only when it's outdoors. So again, we talked about when you go indoors, you lose all of that, but then you can get player load as a substitute, okay? The big thing with this one, it does not give you IMA counts, right? So no A cells, no B cells, no changes of direction. When you go inside, you have to heavily rely on player load. Um, and if you're looking at just a cost standpoint, this is gonna be one of your call it more cost-friendly devices. That's why you don't get some of this stuff. There's not as many components as it, and you don't have the ability to connect to certain satellites, but it is a little easier to afford and use. Right, so then we're gonna move over to the S5. Right, so with the S5, which is the one I'm currently holding right now, 
that does have the ability to connect to GPS and GLONASS, so you get the 32 plus the 24 satellites, which provides more accurate positional data, um, which again, you can only get outdoors because you're gonna lose it when you go inside. You get player load. Now you have the additional IMA counts from uh, inside the device, and you can also get estimated contact information um, in regards to uh, number and intensity of contacts with the match. So like football, um, would be a big one with that. Potentially lacrosse, soccer, it wouldn't matter as much because they're more uh, open field and less contact based. All right, so with our basketballs, we have this device that's called a T6, right? And it relies on local positioning system, right? Which we haven't talked about yet. Right? We talked about the GPS connecting to satellites outside. LPS actually takes GPS signal and funnels it into indoors. Okay, so in order to do that, you have to mount nodes around the venue in which you're training in. So within BJC or within Haluba, you would need to have a, a mount nodes so that way that can collect and filter in GPS data from the satellites and then you can get that positional information out. Um, and that the uh, system that, that Catapult uses to do that is called a clear sky. Um, right now with basketball specifically, right, we do not have the clear sky nodes set up in the arena right so you cannot get that positional data right now but within the device you can still get player load and imas so what our thought process was working with the coaches over there the strength coaches was if you start here and can only get player load and ima data especially if you're just starting to implement it that kind of narrows down the amount of information you get which is an advantage right away, right? Because you're not bogging yourself down in data and information that you're collecting, right? So then eventually you want to get the uh, LPS system put in so that way now they can get positional stuff. Now they're comfortable with collecting some of the data and they can add to it. Question? Yep. Is, so is that more like a but add on that you can add to the other X4 and S5? No. It's by itself. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the, the other two devices does not have, do not have the ability to connect to Clear Sky. Right? So if you had it mounted, say, in Haluba, football's wearing these, we have clear sky mounted. These devices cannot tap into that clear sky. Gotcha. Right? This one can't, all right? But it only functions indoors. This particular device does not function outdoors in regards to the positional stuff, right? You're always gonna be able to get play load and IMA because it's all local on the device. But in regards to positional, it will not get it outdoors. It will only get it indoors if you have the LPS set up. Does that make sense? Question. Yep. Do you think um, in the future for all sports that practice in Haluba during the offseason, like yep. winter, do you think that would be something that you would maybe buy those devices just for the winter for all these sports or no? Or do you think that would never be an option? Great question. Okay. <laughs> so we're, we're video, so we're, we won't go into too many contractual things, but in a perfect world, what we would do is everyone that uses Haluba would get the next device that he's about to talk to. Okay. Then they would have a hybrid unit to be able to go inside or outside. Yeah. Is that what you asked? Yeah. 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 That would be a perfect world. Uh, in terms of funding that, that's for another video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. But great question for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that does bring us into the last device, which is this new vector unit, right? So this one has functionality to tap into LPS and then also has GPS functionality, right? So you can go indoors, outdoors, get positional data, as long as you do have that clear sky mounted. Um, it has the ability to do both, so you're not limited by being outdoors or indoors. Um, so you can get basically everything, you get positional data, player load, IMAs, contacts, everything. So it's like a Cadillac of Catapult, right? Like this is your big high dollar unit that's gonna give you the most information. That system right there to be in new offers you a couple extra um, features as well where you know like you guys reporting in soccer it comes right to the receiver and shows up on your laptop the receiver on the vector system is slightly different than the big tube or the box looking thing mm -hmm. and can you hold that up right here yep that right there and John I'm sure will talk about it but that's a receiver the, re the receiver looks a little bit different and it can also report to um, an iPad so for example you're standing on the side cutting practice on the, on the console computer. Someone can have an iPad or an iPhone app on the field and it's also reporting to that. 
So in y'all's situation with Sam, as he wants to see heart rate, that could potentially be an option with that system. Yeah. So it wouldn't be like, yeah. so, so it wouldn't be like his, he talks about how the heart rate, whenever he looks at the iPad, it was like super laggy. So it was like stopping and then it would jump and then it would stop and then it would jump. Like it wasn't like fluent. So with this, it would like take care of all that stuff. Much smoother. It's, if I remember correctly, and I had to reference this, but there's more Bluetooth. Have you been? Yeah, we've used Bluetooth. It moves yeah. from the device to the iPad and the receiver via Bluetooth. Okay. So it's quickly right there. So it would seem like it would be a little bit less um, of a lag time. Yeah, and then with the catapult, you can also attach the heart rate by polar on it straight away to sync it on the bit. And then you got uh, like right now, if you have an iPad that relies on Wi-Fi pretty heavily, so uh, Wi-Fi and Aruba can be pretty pretty spotty. You can interrupt that connection a little bit and get in the line of feedback. So, um, then so we talked about right the hardware, the devices. Now going into the software very briefly, right? So there's two different applications we look at right, when we're using Catapult. One is the Open Field Console, right? So that is actually issued on a Catapult laptop. They give you a laptop, they have the software added on there, right? And that's gonna do a couple different things, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but here's Marissa's setup that she has with women's soccer on the floor and she sits like cross-legged. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's when we're collecting live data and we'll talk about that in a second. And then we have Open Field Cloud, which you can access from any computer or laptop that has Wi-Fi. You just log into your account um, and then you get on that way. So just to break these down very briefly. So open field console, which was shown in the uh, first picture, you're gonna kind of manage the devices on there. Right? So you're gonna assign a device to a particular athlete. You're gonna use that to set alarms, right? Which can automatically turn the devices on at certain times. Like right now, if I went on there and set um, an alarm for 1230, which is in two minutes, this would automatically turn on. Right, you can use it to change this from indoor to outdoor mode, which we're not gonna get too deep into, but we talked into this only having or only having certain functionalities, like you have to have it set to indoor or outdoor mode depending on where you're training. Um, so those are some things you can do to manage the device. Um, also within the console, you can do live monitoring, which we kind of touched on a little bit. So when you're out at training, you can get live information back. Again, with the new device, you can kind of get that a little easier because of the uh, Bluetooth connectivity. Um, you can use it for live period and drill tap, uh, tracking and tagging. So as a session is going on and you're set up at the laptop, we can start and stop when a drill start and like starts and ends, right? So as we're going through a practice, say we have a specific drill we're doing, um, as soon as they start the drill, we start it, as soon as it ends, it ends, and now we capture what that specific drill looks like within a training session in terms of the amount of work and data that we're collecting in that period, right? Um, and then within the console, you also download the data from the device um, onto the app, onto the computer, and then you sync it to the cloud. So when we're looking at the cloud, what you can do then, right, is you can actually manage um, your team and athlete profile. So if you're adding a new athlete, if you need to update pictures, update numbers, jersey numbers, positions, we'll do it in there. Um, but the main functionality of it is to build widgets, reports, and visualizations. So within there, it has a pretty uh, fairly intuitive dashboard to where you can build various reports and look at a bunch of different things. We talked about some of like the metrics or parameters that it gives you. You can also create custom ones in there um, by creating like calculations based on some things you want to see. Um, and then you can also export the data as well. If you don't like the functionality or if you feel like it's limited, um, with the open field dashboard builder, you can export it via CSV and then move it into whatever else. If you like to use Excel, you can move it into Excel. If you like to use R, you can move it into whatever you want to do. You can pull that data out um, and then put it into a different program in order to kind of do your thing and build a report with it. So, um, in a second, we're going to go and I'm going to have Marissa come up here and she's just going to kind of quickly walk through like what it looks like on the console to monitor or start and measure a live session. Um, but we just went over a bunch of stuff, talked about why we use Catapult and why it was you know, helpful for us here at Penn State. What are some limitations you think exist with using this text? I'll open the floor. Like, you want to raise your hand, speak out, it doesn't matter. Like, what are some things that um, 
may provide some complications still in using this. Players forgetting their apparatuses. Yeah, apparatuses. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 the guys look different from the women. It's not the same. <laughs> Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Um, sometimes we have a lot of problems with girls wearing the wrong size sports bra. Yeah. So then the unit is just kind of like bouncing around in their back and we don't really notice until after and then it says they went like 12 millimeters in practice. Yeah. And then we have to fix that. And yeah, exactly. They do the same thing the next day they wear the wrong size sports bra. All right. Mm. What else? What are potential, like you're talking about com basically compliance yeah. and maybe not wearing it. How do you increase compliance of you know, athletes, guys or girls wearing it? Set it up right in front of them. Yeah, it's got to be, you know. Turn them on for them, do everything for them. Pretty easy to put on, you know, create, create buy-in by making it so they don't have a thousand steps, you know. What else? Guys are pretty good about wearing them. Sometimes when they do forget, I'll just have to hand it to them. And they're like, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Like, I just forgot to put them on. Yeah. But yeah. they're pretty good. Yeah, they're pretty good about wearing them. You have a pretty good relationship with them, though, right? Yeah. So you can approach them. So yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. One of the major takeaways is having a relationship with your athletes so that they can you know, respect you to put it on. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, you want to come up here? Mm -hmm. Well, this is loading up to another uh, potential limitation is we talked about it a couple times, but within sport, um, like it can, I mean, even with the compliance piece, it could be messy a little bit, right? We're not in a completely standardized control, controlled setting. So the information we, we may, you know, get some missing data, some extreme outliers through error and stuff. So we just have to take that into consideration when we're performing any like analysis of looking at some of the data, like some of those things we're not gonna be able to control specifically just because of the chaotic like nature of the environment, right? So we just gotta, you know, keep that in mind. It's not always gonna be perfectly rarely ever is, so. So this is your home screen. Um, you can do basically everything from this. Um, new activity is what we do whenever we're starting practice, but there's a device manager that he was talking about adding players and um, transferring data, uploading it and all that stuff. So you just go to new activity and then it opens again. <laughs> and then this is like your, your dashboard, what pops up whenever you are starting any kind of activity. So on the side here, you have like all of your players. Um, so these, this football team's like, they're broken up into their groups of their positions, but for soccer, it's just one, one team. And then there's this little play button up here. And when the receiver is hooked up to it, um, you press play and then all of your active players show up right here. Um, and then this is like your activity bar. This is like your training for the day. Um, so when we add players to periods, this, you name this, like you just double click and then you can rename it. We usually go training and then the date. So like today would be training 2-21-2020. And then we tag the day just so they know what day it is. Like here you can do like three days before a game, two days, one day, the actual game, all this stuff. And then you can go day of the week. Um, and then the second tag is just actually training. We have training tag in here so they know like exactly what day they're looking at. And then, down here you have your different tabs. So like this is a map. You can see you can see where the players actually are. Um, on ours it has like for the outdoor it has 
Jeffrey Field, and you can see like exactly where all of the units are, and you can see them running around. Um, and then when you're indoor, you just it's different. The outdoor tables and indoor tables. So um, if something looks goofy, you might just be like, looking at the outdoor table if you're indoor. So just go to the indoor table, and then when you add a period up here, a big like table will pop up every player, and then it shows whatever like parameters that you have chosen to look at like in your in your um, table. So for soccer, we have load and a bunch of different heart rate things. Um, outdoor, you have um, distance, high speed distance. Um, what else we have? Player load, um, heart rate, different things like that. So that'll all pop up right here and it'll change live as you're in a period. Um, so you can see what's happening and then it'll show you the average too. So like sometimes um, Erica, the head coach, will come over to me and ask specifically for like one drill and she'll be like, what load are we at? Usually she asks what load. So she'll be like, where are we at right now? And then you just look at the average and tell her and it's just like, all right, cool. And then she runs away. Um, so they, she specifically does like to ask stuff during practice because she also has numbers in her head of what she wants to hit. So sometimes she'll be like, hey, wave your hand whenever we're reaching like our load for the day. And then she just, she listens to the numbers and counts and gives her. So. Can you uh, real quick just show, like you can do it right now, even though it's not <coughs> going on. Yeah, can you add a period, like say this would be like, um, like you should call it first quarter. Or like like this. warm up or something yeah, like that. Whatever. So this plus period adds a period in. So we're looking at it live right now. So you have this top bar, which is your whole training for the day. And then this bottom bar is a period. So let's say this was, we were just starting. So this is our warm up. So we tag or we title it warm up. So this is your title, which is more specific. Um, and then your tag is kind of like the general thing that's going on. So like they have first half, second half, indoor, whatever you want. So if it were for soccer, we would go, we would title it warm up and then tag it warm up. And if it was something like, and then it pops up your warm up. Um, so it's going, it tells you the duration it's going. Um, so if it's, Anyway, I was going to say something important, I guess, but um, when you're looking at it live, you can graph things that you want to watch. So over here, you can just select all, and then you can right click and say graph. And then if you want to look at player load. You, you can do that with uh, just. I can do that? Yeah, do it with the DBs. Just throw the DBs in there. Okay. And then, so you select all of them. Oh, PIP is like. I think it's called player in period. Yep. That's what Bree said. Yep. Um, so that like the pip is this period that's already going. So a new period is something that will pop up here that this is the pip. Yeah. So so, then, so essentially, um, right, you have that warm up period running right now, and that pip box, that PIP box right there, shows all the athletes that are thrown into that period, right? So whenever you download the data and sync it to the cloud later, their data will be within that warm up. Like if you didn't put anyone in there and you have that warm up period running, when you go to look at the data afterward, you have zeros for everybody because you didn't place them within that period. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so then you can select all of them, right click, graph, and then... If you have live information, it yeah. would show, it would show like a velocity or player. Yeah, so like you have this green showing up right here. Um, and then you can see this helps like, it helps a lot when say you miss adding a period um, it happens to me sometimes, like whenever I'll, I might be talking to Bree at practice or Sam and I miss like the start of a period. So you can graph their, either it's like outside, it would be like their velocity, inside we go like player load or we look for like a spike in heart rate. Um, and then we can add a period based on like, okay, their player load started spiking. So I know that's when they started the period. So that's what like the graph is, is good for. Um, could, could you end that one and then just show like mm -hmm. how you would adjust times, like how mm -hmm. you adjust time for the period to do that? So to end, you can right click and stop, or there's like a stop button at the bottom. There's a couple like different ways to do things. So you just like find the way that you like to do it. Um, and then like if, if this warm up went too long or something like that. Yeah. So you need to reduce it. say this warm up like stopped here, but I wasn't paying attention and I stopped it here. 
so you can double click and then you have the start and end time so if it really ended at like 1239 instead of 41 you can literally just put in 1239 and then it reduces back to where it should stop um, so a big thing that i told katrina when i was teaching her the other day was like don't freak <coughs> out no matter what you do the data will be there if the unit is on the data will be there so even if things are not looking right like a lot of times there are some issues that come up like during practice and you're just like i don't know what's happening i don't know what to do once you download it it'll all be there so you really can't mess it up so you can you can do all of this stuff after practice like after it's downloaded so you could essentially just like let it run for the whole day and then clip it later um, it's easier to clip it during practice just so you don't have to do it later um, so then if another period was starting like they were going like 1v1 or finishing something like that, you would just, again, like select all, add period, and then that tip, the training bar catches up, and then the new period starts, and you just title it, tag it, and then that's pretty much it. It's, it's simple, it looks complicated, but it's pretty simple. And a lot of it is just learning by doing over and over. <laughs> uh, he showed uh, how to do like substitutions, like interchanges and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, these active players will show up or say we added to the pip. So let me just add to this pip right here. So then we go, say like nine was coming out. This is during games. You guys sub, you guys sub during practice. Mm -hmm. So we, for soccer, we don't sub during practice. Um, that's probably something that they'll like look into doing, but you would just select whoever was coming out, hit, is it show? No, I'm just inter different. Yeah, just interchange. Right next to the door. Yeah. Interchange, and then there's a red box around their number right there, so that tells you that they're not in. So then it doesn't track them because, say, they're just like standing over on the sideline. So it won't put the data that is not highlighted in the number, so it won't mess it up. So you won't have a zero like dragging everything down. Um, and if they come back in, you just click on them again, interchange again, and then see it doesn't it doesn't track that that white space right there. Um, so it just makes it a little bit more accurate if you're looking at your data. Yeah. And again, like she mentioned too, if the device is on, that data, even in that white gap, it's still being collected on the device. But when you actually go to look at it afterwards, it's only going to show you the information that's within those green boxes. Unless you go back and edit it and then just put them in everything, then it'll change, right? Because the data is still there. Yeah. Marissa, can you uh, stop that period? Yep. Start a new period. Now, put in yeah four or five athletes individually. Good, bam. All right, now let's substitute two for thirty-eight. Two for thirty-eight. So two's already up top. And then do the same thing for. So it didn't put thirty-eight in there. So. Because usually I just do it with like the active player button. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's, so that's a potential problem, right? Yeah. That is, yeah, right. You can't, you can't, if they're not in a period, you can't substitute them in and out. So they have to be within there, right? Right. Yeah, you gotta throw 38 in there. You can just go 38, tip, bam. And then they're already out, so, or now 38's out. You want 38 in, two out. So now you can see that. Because when we um, sub in games, everybody, what we do is we just put everybody in the game first. And then we go through and click whoever the subs are and then interchange them out. So everybody's always in the game. Um, you can sub really easily. Um, but we don't do that during practice because it's a little more difficult. And a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And they're all active. Yeah, and our, our coaches haven't really said much about it because we've talked to them before about it, but um, Rhi always told me, like, um, she wasn't sure if they wanted to be like, intentional with their pauses in practice, like their talking, like she didn't know if she wanted to actually, like, account for that rest in there or not, so it's something that we started playing around with, but Rhi was just like, I don't know what they want to do yet, like, they might actually want those pauses in there, so we're just going to keep it. <laughs> And going back to the interchange two thing, so you can select two athletes at a time, right? So you have who's that two that's red, mm -hmm. right? And then if you also select 38, 
right? And then hit interchange again and it swaps them, right? So you can do that at the same time just by clicking like multiple boxes and doing that. So now 38 is out and two is in, just within one you know, interchange click. Um, check this out. All right, stop this period. Now, let's imagine you have, this is just one way you can do it, another layer. You don't have to do this. Let's say you have two different drills going on. You have these athletes over here and these athletes over here, and you want to put them in two drills that are occurring at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if we were splitting, uh, this plus button is another way to add live periods. And if, we were, if they were starting at the exact same time, I would just hit this twice. So then these two periods are going at the exact same time. So the one you want to put people in, like this cord four right here, we'll put VVs in that one. And then their pip in the one that's highlighted. So then we go to this one, there's nobody in it yet. We'll put these guys in that one. Bam. And then you can just see, like you can make sure you have the right people in there and then change. This table changes depending on what, what period you're selecting. So like if you uh, put somebody in, like say when you added 38 in later on, mm -hmm. does it only track them from that point or does it all of a sudden all their information is being pulled in from the beginning? So the beginning of the period. If you add them to a period and they weren't there originally, yeah. and you put them in the period, it'll go from the start of the period. If you interchange them through and they're already in the period, it'll gap it out like she had just done. Yeah. Like that, like that quarter three, right there, right. If yeah. she, if she just right now, it's already stopped. It started. It stopped. If she threw like all the O linemen in there, like all their data would show up in there. You know what I'm saying? Like they didn't have to be in that period while the session was running. You could retroactively throw them in there, and their data that's being recorded on the device will be yeah. mapped out within that period of time. So then, wouldn't it make? like make more sense to always add everybody and then interchange to people out that aren't in there so that like you're not adding somebody in after and then all of a sudden all their data you just get it from the point that they get yeah added. yeah yeah so that like sense? yeah for so like lacrosse as an example right? yeah they're like start and stop okay so like when they go from like in a game right say um they start the face off we throw everybody in right and we substitute out the guys that aren't in there right so they're red the face off starts those guys that aren't in are red, but they're in PIP, yeah. right? All of them are in there. And then when they come on, we'll like interchange them back and forth that way. Gotcha. So it would have to be in the period, yeah. Like if you're doing it live, yeah. like that's a big thing you cannot do accurately like post training. Like yeah. if you're doing interchanges and substitutions, especially in a sport like lacrosse where it's so frequent, yeah. like you're not gonna be able to accurately do that post. Like you have to do it right there. Yeah. Soccer, if you have timestamps, you may be able to. Um, but yeah, what you're saying is you're correct. You need them in the session, remove them, and then sum them in and out as you go throughout. Cool. So yeah, I understand. Thanks. Yep. Which I think like women's across, they don't substitute as much. It didn't seem like he was. We'll follow up with him on today about that. Yeah, just because like just the nature of the sport, like with men's lacrosse, I think they're on and off like yeah. more frequently yeah. than women's lacrosse, and they stay on for longer periods of time without yeah. substituting. Any questions with this? I think the coolest thing about this is, I think John said it, Marissa said it, where it's like the more you get kind of playing around with it, the more intuitive it becomes. It's kind of like Facebook. You just kind of learn by doing. It's breadcrumbs as you go. Let's, at this point, let's practice just ended. Mm -hmm. Now what do we do? So, Take me through like, hey, I just collected the units, we just put them on the dock and I hit download. Mm -hmm. Okay, so stop this. Um, and then you can go back to this main screen. So after the players put their units in the box, they all have to be turned off and then you go to upload them. So then you plug the box in and they all light up green. So now they're charging and then you plug the box into the laptop. Now they're ready to flow to the laptop basically. Yeah, you cannot download unless the box is plugged into the power outlet and then mm -hmm. the box is plugged into the laptop. Yeah. You'll not be able to get that data. Mm -hmm. So then you go back to this home screen and we go to data transfer. So it'll close like current activity. We close, yes, you want to close the practice because you're done with it. Um, and after it closes, um, all of your 
players that are connected to the computer will show up right here. In the status, it'll say a percentage, and then the bar will fill up, and you can s literally see like how much of their data has been uploaded. So then you just kind of watch it, wait, and then it'll say like importing finished. So once they're all finished uploading, it tells you the duration too. So if you really want to make sure that you got the right day in there and like all the data is there, it'll tell you like if we went for an hour at practice, it'll tell you duration one hour. So you can really make sure like all of it's there, and then you just go fast sync, which updates it all to the cloud that they were talking about so that you can access it from anywhere. So you just go hit fast sync and then it just takes a couple seconds and then just kind of wait and then it's all in the cloud and you can do whatever you want with it from there. And what's the difference between the fast and the full sync? So if you go full sync, it's going to get all the little tags and all the little data components. Um, it's a much more thorough. I get, it takes I think longer. It takes a yeah. little bit longer, yeah. Um, we typically will hit fast or uh, full sync um, at the end of every day. Mm -hmm. If you're just working and you have to like, let's say, uh, and this is another little example, but like you'll code them out. So like, let's say uh, Marissa has a, a S5 unit attached to her name. It has a serial number on the back. If we're working and I switch your unit to Josh's unit and I switch those serial numbers, I may hit fast sync real quick just so I can move the numbers fast and then get back to work. But at the end of the day, if I have a big download session or I have a, a, a practice that I've downloaded, I'll hit that full sync yeah. just for... That's those two right here. Yep. Yeah. Here's a thing for you too. I might save you some time, but like when you're downloading the data, mm -hmm. Uh, or transferring it, you can automatically hit, hit fast full sync. sync. Yeah, yeah it'll do it after. Yeah, yeah, so you don't have to worry about waiting for the transfers to happen and then syncing. Mm -hmm. Like it'll automatically just line it to do it after the data transfers. Mm -hmm. So, how many days of like data can it hold? Twenty-eight. Yeah, I think it, I think it's twenty-eight, or that's what was told to me. Yeah. Um, actually, I take that back. It's like. 28 days worth of normal data. So like if you had like 10 five hour sessions, that may be different than 28 30 minute sessions. But typically it holds quite a bit. I used to hold, um, ran this with baseball um, at a time and we would go on the road and I would never download until I got back home. So I would never even worry about that. I would just run it the three game set and practice BP and then come back and download it all. And it would be on there. And then from a battery life, it should, from the moment it's turned on, like it should at least have five hours of battery life. If for whatever reason the device dies within that five hours, it's probably the battery's probably faulty and then we usually just like exchange it. But it should have a minimum of five hours from the moment it's turned off to the moment it's turned on. on so. Any questions at all? For this one. Yeah. Any questions at all? Oh, one other thing I was thinking about too. So whenever she was like talking about naming the activities, like we call this warm up, you know, we might call this 77, right? The more consistent you can be with naming the tags from a data perspective, right, Samir? The yeah. better it's gonna be and the cleaner it's gonna be whenever you're trying to like, if you pull that information from um, Cavalcade, you export it into whatever, it's gonna be for you to group that information, right? So if you say, uh, warm up capital W space capital U on one day and then the next day you have capital W lowercase u or capital W hyphen lowercase u like if you're trying to uh, group that data by warm up like you want to say okay what was our average of every warm up we've ever done right it's going to create separate averages because they're not named the same thing it makes your data like messy so if you have like specific drills you do frequently you want to make sure those things are named exactly the same like every single time with like case sensitivity, spacing, like everything. Otherwise you can have to go back and it's gonna be a shit show. Yeah. It may be useful to have like a department wide like format for that. Yeah. Kind of decide like for everyone what every like what everyone's gonna use for every session that may help. Because yeah. I've seen that with like names, like people spelling names differently. Uh, or nicknames. Or, yeah, nicknames, something like that. Yeah. yeah. It kinda like throws things off. All good? All right, so that is 
there's a lot of information right there, a lot of cool things. Um, but some of you guys are already managing systems. Some of you guys are going to. Uh, Dawson, Katrina, you guys will be getting going with uh, some women's lacrosse here. Um, but uh, the more you use it, the more familiar and more uh, comfortable you'll become. This is a great system to know how to use because you can, it can get you your foot in the door a lot, especially if you're um, in the strength business, if you're into wanting to be around sport. Um, this is a great system because it's becoming very widespread. A lot of the concepts here too are applicable with other GPS companies. There's other GPS companies out there. We use Catapult here, but there's a lot of other ones. Concepts or principles associated with this, with tagging, you know, putting athletes in, they're gonna be somewhat universal, although the, the workflow may be a little bit different, but good system to have. Um, I got a video of this too. I'll put it private on YouTube within our account and I'll save it on the W Drive eventually. So if anybody wants to reference it again, you can certainly do that. And uh, if you got questions, get with one of us. I think the best way to learn is by doing. So if you want more information, uh, get on board. There's some things too that are not as sexy as this, like setting up. Some teams are gonna require some setup um, with this. So there's some of that we'll talk about in the future, but um, if you have questions, follow up. Yeah. And I'll send the PowerPoint to everybody too, so if you wanna reference it, if you can get something, taken down, otherwise that you want to go back and look at it. Yeah. All right, thank you guys.